Uh, welcome everybody to this week's uh, webinar, part of the series of six speakers. Tonight we've got Mike Fisher. Uh, uh, Mike is one of the experts in anger management. In fact, I think, Mike, you were one of the first people in the UK to actually focus and concentrate on anger management and bring kind of a consciousness to uh, people's understanding around anger and the management of it. And I think you've written two books, Beating Anger and Mindfulness and the Management of Anger. If I'm the, art of, the Mindfulness and the Art of Managing oh, Anger. Art of Managing Anger. But you've also been on several TV programs. You've been quite uh, vocal in newspapers, documentaries, articles, and so forth. So it's, I'm delighted to have you. We had you a couple of weeks ago to discuss kindness uh, in this particular era of uh, the COVID. Um, tonight, we're going to look at uh, turning adversity into opportunities, which is sort of a continuation of the conversation I was having with uh, Caroline Webb last week. Before we go into that, I just want to thank the sponsors, which is Draeger. Uh, thank you very much for their support and being able to uh, give us the opportunity to have these conversations with people like yourself, Mike, as well as uh, C3 Post Trade and 507 Capital who've also supported us in being able to provide these conversations, these valuable conversations. So turning adversity into opportunity, Mike, tell me about that. Well, I thought you might ask that question. So uh, let me see where I want to go, because, you know, we, uh, we didn't go into a lot of deep discussion prior to, to this, this conversation. Um, well, I look at... Well, I've obviously looked at adversity within the context of COVID-19. Yeah. Simply because this is a, a phase of our lives in modern history, which is unprecedented. And uh, it's very interesting to see how, as a humanity, we either use it to our advantage, yeah. and we use it to transform our lives, or we use it um, against ourselves. And so what I did, as, as you already know, Chris, what, one of the things I did is I, I looked at the opportunities in adversity. How can we use adversity and see it as an ally? And um, that's basically what I did. So just to start with, what, what is adversity? What do you think adversity is? Well, in, in my view, anything that really challenges my comfort zone, yeah. anything that puts me in a position where I feel whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or the combination of the two, which I experience myself as resisting, that's, that's about as close as I can get to it. So something that's going to make us tense up go into a sort of reaction defense? Well, I, I think more than that, it, it, it's more than tensing up. I think it's more like going into panic, which yeah. then, of course, as you know, triggers our anxiety, our fear. We then start to catastrophize. We start to futurize. And um, we get consumed by this phenomenon called why me or why us? Say a bit more. Why me? In the sense of feeling. Well, I, you know, I look at it. I look at it from the from the per perspective. If I can just use this example, you know, and I I, I do have to touch wood because I haven't caught uh, the virus. Um, but you know, we're no longer in lockdown in the in Spain. So it, actually, I think it's more dangerous now than it's ever been. Um, although we are taking precautions, you know, you just never know. And so I, I think about somebody who is lying on their deathbed because they've caught the virus. And the question is, why me? Why did it happen to me? Right. So that would be one example. Or somebody who has a high-flying job earning, you know, triple, triple figures or quadruple figures. And the next thing that they know is that they laid off. Why me? Or, you know, I'm sitting locked down in my home with my family and I've got nowhere to escape and they are driving me crazy and I'm driving them crazy. Why me? So we, there's something about how we 
uh, embody a kind of a victim persona mm -hmm. and be, forget that this is not just about me, but this is going on for absolutely everybody mm -hmm. on the whole planet. And, and so when you go into that, why me, what happens? What, what's the, the sort of usual, normal sort of reaction response to that? Well, look, you know, keeping in mind as an anger management specialist, um, <clears throat> as you already know, I'm inundated with one-to-one -one work. And also our anger management programs are just filling up like crazy. Um, and so for me, my experience is that, my direct experience is that when they go into that why me, what I would define as victim mode, yeah, they find it very difficult to manage their feelings and emotions. Well, in my case, it happens to be their anger because what they do is they act their, they act their anger out. And so there's something to be said about, um, they take it very personal that this particular pandemic is happening to them. Mm -hmm. Whatever level you want to describe it or even suggest, and rather than seeing the bigger picture, rather than seeing that um, this is happening to everybody and finding our own internal, their own internal way of emotionally integrating or emotionally um, accepting that this is a reality and what we really need to do is to find a creative solution to the distress and the anxiety and fear that we're experiencing. So they feel like, if I can just say this, so they feel like it's only happening to them, mm -hmm. no one else. Mm -hmm. And at the same time it is, in the sense that it's, it's a personal, unique experience, but you're also saying it's, a, it's an important for that not to then become you being a victim, that there's something that you're being persecuted specifically because you're bad or there's something wrong about you, which is often what I, I experience people as sort of making sense of things. There must be something wrong with them, the sort of negative sort of, the way we bring meaning to what's happening to us, um, sort of filtered through a sort of negative prison. But you're sort of, but you're sort of if, if you make it more that this is happening to everybody, that sort of frees you a little bit from that. Well, that, that's, what I, that's what I would certainly support. Yeah. And I need to be the bigger picture. And then if it does, what does that then start to allow to happen? Well, it, 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 well from my perspective, what it does, it, it frees. Look, I can only really go back to my own experience of facing adversity in my own life and mm -hmm. how when I'm faced with that challenge, how I find a, a strategy or a coping mechanism to, to deal with it. Um, because I'm one of those individuals who I tend to uh, catastrophize or I also tend to futurize. And, and what I mean by that is when I get caught up, um, not only why me, but also what if. You know, what if X, Y, Z happens and I'm not emotionally resilient, resilient to deal with it? Or what if um, ABC happens and from a financial perspective, I could go, bankrupt so my my perspective is is that what we have to do and you know if i kind of start to go into chris breaking down some of those points that i was yeah. what i was yeah. um what we've already spoken about so yeah. it's about reminding myself you know that behind every dark cloud is a silver lining now i know it's a cliche and i know it's a metaphor but it, at least it gives me hope or one of one of my most uh, wonderful experiences when I leave um, an airport in London and I've been under a gray cloud, not metaphorically, but physically, for weeks mm. upon weeks upon weeks. And mm. as we break through those clouds, I see a blue sky. So there's something about how we can utilize metaphors to, to jump the curve, to, to look at it slightly differently. You know, COVID-19 is not going to go on for the next 19 years. Okay, so it might go on for the next three, four, five years until they find a vaccine. And then, of course, people are concerned about taking the vaccine. But there's something about finding a way of looking at and reframing our experience. 
So that could be one way of doing it. Other I mean, way, just, just, just on the idea of hope, because that's sort of that's the thing that I'm sort of picking up. It, yes. It, and hope is the sense of what is hope? Hope is sort of a, a belief that there that there are something can come out of this that isn't negative or bad. There's Correct. possibility. Correct. So there's that beautiful, in fact, one of the groups I was running last night. I mean, these people are so, so scared, so overwhelmed, so confused, so lost. And by the time they arrived, because there was a new program starting last night, um, you know, people were like, you know, in a state of, you know, terror, because they have no idea what's going to happen in the next, I don't know, next five minutes, the next five years. But as we started to eat into the evening, and they realized that they're not alone, what actually happened to triggered hope? Just simply, Chris, realizing that they're not alone, that there's 15 people sitting there with exactly the same issues. Maybe a different that, context, but the same issues. And that, in a way that comes back to um, communication, being able to talk about these things. Correct. That, so Correct. that itself literally becomes a way of um, lessening the anxiety, but just, if you name it. Yes. So, verbally. What was knocking at my door last night is there is hope, but I had forgotten the quote. And the quote is, where there is hope, there is life. And mm. I love that quote. Mm. Or the other quote was, you know, faith before hope. I'm not that kind of, because of its con religious connotations. Yeah. You know, I think it takes faith and I think it takes hope, especially in challenging times like we've been experiencing for the last three months. For example, because you were also the, the, the other bit that, you, that to me I sort of a link to the silver lining is one door closes another one opens. Correct. And uh, you know I think that's that's um, I'm glad you remembered that because that's exactly what it is. So, I you know I, I give an example of um, in in my um, in in the blog uh, that I wrote and also I've done a podcast on the subject. But I give this example when I first met my girlfriend, Marina. Um, she was at the tail end of a, a relationship and she was absolutely heartbroken. So, she, you know, she was pretty, not necessarily depressed, but she was pretty sad. And I remember we were, we were going to this beautiful location just outside of uh, where I live in Santander to this ancient village. And we were looking into a building, but there were a couple of layers of glass windows, uh, and doors. And there was this point as we were looking through this window, you know, I said to her, you see, one door closes and one door opens. And as I said that, in the interior of this building, a door opened and a person walked through it. And it was, it was, well, it was beautiful timing, of course. And, and I think there's something really beautiful about considering that every time that you're faced with something negative or unpositive, there are opportunities but we've got to find a way of reframing our relationship to adversity and see the opportunity in adversity. And I think, um, you know, if, if we were running a workshop and we, we had to say to the, the listeners here this evening saying, when you've been faced with adversity, how did you survive and how did you thrive? And actually I can imagine people saying, yes, I faced a lot of adversity. And somehow I pulled through, but at the time I was terrified. But how did you find your way through it? Well, I prayed or I trusted or I found solace in meditation or I found solace in therapy. So I imagine that's the kind of interaction we might have if this was a you know, therapeutic circle. And, and so, so that group that you did last night, so in a way the first step was sort of just acknowledging the, the experiences people were having, sort of being able to share it, own it, acknowledge it. Is that right? Well, yes. I apologize for the children outside, but this is Spain and children are loud and I love it. Because they sound like they're having lots of fun. Um, look, as, as, as you said, as soon as people talk and other people listen and they're able to empathize and they're able to identify, they're able to relate, something shifts on an energetic level. I mean, we both know this from our work as, as therapists. Yes. But, but, I, but I do think there's something, I think there's something really puff, profound 
when there's a resonance through the group and they're able to both identify and em sorry identify empathize and resonate and um in them knowing that they're not alone they're not the freak they're not the weirdo that that is that is actually i see is, a, is one of the transformative moments and with that if i'm not alone that gives me hope and I, i'm loving this conversation by the way because it's nice to unpack it and, th and then from that from that just a sense of i mean what would you say it is a sense of belonging a sense of connectedness with others what happens next well let me let me just take a step back just for the moment you know so when i was when I was um, 30 years old, and I was a really angry young man, and all I can say to you, Chris, is I used to sit and ponder, I can't be the only angry person on this planet, because anger really wasn't spoken about. Yeah. No one discussed it. And I imagine that the individuals who come to my programs, there, there is something to be said about that they feel so powerless, so hopeless, so helpless that just a little bit of attention, a little bit of acknowledgement, a little bit of space can make all the difference. But can you go back to answering, asking the question again? Well, you sort of, for me, you've sort of set the, the, the tone. I mean, part of the, these conversations, bringing you in, Mike, is to sort of normalize some of the, the sort of internal struggles that we all have. And just, I mean, it's just so clear from, uh, the work we do and Caroline Webb last week is being able to name, label, acknowledge these things is the starting point. You know, if you go inside, if you start to internalize things, then you start going down a rabbit hole with a kind of distorted mirror of what's, of what the truth is. And then you start to get into catastrophizing, which in further sort of deepens your sense of isolation and sort of removal from others. So that's what I'm reminded of, is you, you set the scene where people are openly acknowledging what it is that's happening for them without, um, uh, they may have concerns of, of being judged or criticised, but ultimately I don't think that it will be received and acknowledged that in, in terms of people having similar experiences. So when you set that, what, how do you then build upon it? What happens next? Within the, within the context of adversity or within the context of the of the group i'm not sure well, well can you can you use the group to kind of expand a bit on the opportunity well, I, for diversity well look i, I mean, just i mean just it well, just about the group what ha what happened next in just well, let, me, let me let me let me let me let me just develop i think it's a great question but i just need just a couple of seconds to unpack it um because keep in mind I'm, I'm working pretty blind here so i'm just going with you know my own innate wisdom um, so, and I think it's a great question, so let me deliver on it. Um, so, I, I think what happens, Chris, in fact, I know what happens, is that if there's a sparkle or an inkling of hope, it does mean that I can trust the future. However fragile the future might be, I can trust it. And in fact, the third point that I make here is, Trust your future self. He has a clear idea of where he is going, even if you don't. Let me repeat it. Trust your future self. Even though you don't have a clear idea of where you're going, he or she does. And, you know, I, I think that's kind of a, uh, that was a spark of genius, actually. But I, I know it's, it's, it's um, I think it's a directly linked to quantum psychology uh, and quantum physics, actually. Um, but, but there is something about, you know, however dark it gets, can I trust that whatever happens, it's going to be okay? Yeah. And I, and I think that's what happens when they get a spark of hope. I mean, it's very interesting even for me to articulate that, actually. I mean, the, the way I first heard it is the hope comes from not being alone. Yes. There is something in this that... that all kinds of different people are experiencing, um, which I suppose for me would kind of bring a sort of a grounding, a sort of centering of myself in the face of these things. And then, so just expand a little bit, sort of, you, you're sort of saying just trust 
whatever happens, you'll be, you'll be okay? Well, you see, it's an internal dialogue that I'm having myself, with myself. You know, I'm saying to myself, um, Mike, um, so, you know, which Mike is that? Which part of me is that? Is that, you know, my past self or is that my yeah. present yeah. self? Is that my future self? And by the way, I'm just unpacking it. I'm just un yeah. un unpacking it as I go along, yeah? Yeah. Um, so I'm saying to myself, Mike, you know what? Don't worry about this, buddy. You've been faced with a huge amount of adversity in your life. You're going to get through this. And I'm going to make sure you get through this. It has yeah. that quality to it. But if I can just give you an anecdote. Um, on the 17th of March, I was at Stansted Airport um, to fly back to Spain. And I remember going up the ramp. I know what I said, what I talked about. But I was absolutely terrified. There was no one around. You know, it was all about doom and gloom. I was reading so much material about the start of the pandemic, and it was just pure chaos. So I'm going up this ramp into the airport, which is empty. And everybody in the airport has either got masks on or not, but it's empty, and there's this kind of deathly silence. Now, you can imagine at 7 o'clock, stands at the airport. That is really unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, so as I'm going up that ramp, I'm noticing that I panic, and I say to the child part of me, I said to the child part of me, don't worry about this. I got your back. We will get through this. I will make sure that you are safe. So who is that? Is that my future self talking to my past self? Is that my present self listening to my present self? Or is that the witness or the observer? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would, as you're talking, I'm sort of, how, how would I approach that as sort of our references are our history. And in our history is the patterns and the beliefs and the meanings that we bring that will automatically reference to how things are going to be in the future. So when, when you talk about adversity, turning adversity into opportunity, it's both uh, an opportunity to uh, bring a kindness and a sort of conscious awareness to what history is, uh, has influenced us in terms of our identity and our sense of self, but also the opportunity to kind of revisit that, question it, be kind to it, but not necessarily be led and sort of defined by it as we move into the future. Yeah, you know, how I, and you know, I hate to agree, but I guess I have to agree. I mean, that's beautifully put, actually. It's a wonderful way um, of putting it. Um, so say some of the, what was that? Because you, you, you listed 14 points, didn't you? Yeah, and the, <laughs> The next point, well, look, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that the, the listeners who, who are here with us this evening understand this idea of being able to trust my future self, because it's a concept. Um, I think it's a really novel concept, and, and I think it's a potentially healing concept. It's like, I might not know where I'm going right now, but there is a part of me that will take care that wherever I go, I'm going to be okay. I will be okay no matter how challenging it is. So I'll park that and I'll move on. So the next one is to remind and reassure yourself that every situation is an opportunity for growth. I have to remind myself of that. It's not just a concept, but I need to say, Mike, this is an opportunity. However negative or however disastrous, however terrifying you are, take this as an opportunity and reframe your experience to whatever you're actually facing and whatever you're living now. Do, do you then also remind or educate, give, give people a sort of toolbox or understanding of, you know, when we go into reaction, that's quite difficult to sort of hold on to. Do you also give people feedback about finding a way, because you're sort of talking about hope, um, a sort of trust in the future, but when the body and the mind is in reaction, do you have your own sort of sort of valuable insights or sort of ways of sort of, guiding people away from being in, being in reaction? So, you know, keeping in mind that, um, and I think we, we, we might have touched on this in the last uh, conversation you and I had, but within the context of what I do, we have six rules. So when the person either goes into fight or flight or freeze, all yeah. they have to remember, all they have to remind themselves of those six rules. Stop, think, take a look at the big picture. It's okay to have a different opinion. Use your support network. Uh, use your anger management journal. 
um, uh, don't take anything personally. Let go of your expectations. And so there's something about that. I say to people, even if you forget everything that you've learned over this weekend or these eight or nine weeks, that's all you have to remember. So when you go into meltdown or you slide down the rabbit hole, you want to be able to have that engineered into your psyche. Nailed. So, so break it down again, just say those six, so, six things. So stop, think, take a look at the big picture. I mean, the conversation we're having now is all about big, big picture thinking. Seeing outside my comfort zone, seeing outside my own um, my, um, microscopic perspective of what I'm enduring, what I'm going through. So, so you, sort of, you become an observer, sort of in a way stand outside of yourself. Yes, absolutely. And part of one, way, one way to do cool. that. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. Well, one way to do that is, is to do what you've just said, which is to remember, remind yourself of a bigger picture. Yes. Okay. But that, I see that as the observer or the witness. Yeah. Because I'm, of course, there's a part of me that's completely thrown into crisis and meltdown, and yeah. I don't have access to any awareness, but it's all part of, you know, kind of brain gymnastics. It's about training my brain. So when all else fails and I don't have access to any, any consciousness, that what, that's what comes through. So uh, uh, picture. Uh, just to say to people who are, who are listening, because I'm beginning to get questions, and I can throw them in because part of it was we're going to have questions later on, but I've just, I've just sort of read one that seems very pertinent. If, if you've got a history of screwing things up, if, if everything you reference about the past is kind of proof that it will be catastrophic or it is going to go bad, how do you push back against that? What do you... Well, you know, that's, this, this whole conversation between you and I is all about that. You know, yeah. the individual who is glass half empty, you yeah. find it really, really difficult because of their history, because of all the traumas they've endured. And then when you have somebody who glass is half full, which I'm more that character, I'm, mm. I tend to be more positive than negative. Um, it, it, it's about being able to apply, you know, some of the um, some of these points that we're starting to unpack. But and it, is there is there a place to to spend time giving attention to 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 the you that felt because if you feel like you screwed up, then you, you're living quite a lot of self-criticism a sort of judgment of yourself is, is there a is there a moment of sort of attending to that that history that person that you were still feel you are with i mean going back to what we were uh, talking about a couple of weeks ago about kindness where does that what what part does that play in in the process as you move forward well look uh, I, I mean to put it very very simply i think that um, the, the, the challenge that an individual like that has is to be able to notice, I think this is part of what you're saying, is to notice that when I start to terrorize myself, when I start to terrorize myself, I need to be able to, at the point that I start to do that, is to catch myself. Now, you know that I'm not suggesting this is easy, Chris. Yeah, but yeah. it's part and parcel of any form of therapeutic alliance or counseling relationship or any, any form of personal professional development where we, we increase our awareness to how we react and how we respond. And so I don't think there's an easy answer, but I do think that if I think about my own direct experience of you know, the years that I've spent in therapy, um, that's part of what I've had to do. And, and so what I mean by that is that, you know, I have my own history of depression. I have my own history of trauma. I have my own history of generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder. Um, and I found my way through it, but I found my way through it through the therapeutic process not through my years and years of smoking cannabis or acting out, but just by being able to stay very focused on the process of therapy, group work, and 
psychoeducational processes. So I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but it is certainly we've got to start somewhere. And so, so one of your, um, that was a very sweet reply, Mike. Um, said a bit more about change. Am I right to remember change your circumstances, change your reality? Yeah. So you remember you and I, we, we had that conversation recently about a particular client of mine and a young man who just is just getting himself into lots and lots of trouble. And if you remember, one of the things that you advised me was, well, you know, why doesn't he travel? And that's very, I mean, you know, first of all, I thought it was a great intervention, but the other dimension to that was, and I remember this from when I was a young man and I was depressed and I was lost and I was scared. Um, I remember reading something about, about if you change your circumstance, that's the way you change your reality. So you get on a plane and you go somewhere else. Now you could say, well, hold on, hold on a second, Mike. You know, we're talking about lockdown here. Yeah, that's really what we're talking about. But I do think there's something to be said. Even if I go from one room to another room, mm -hmm. even if I go from my, my house and I take a walk around the lake, or even if I go upstairs and I do a half an hour of exercise, even if I go downstairs and I open a book that's going to give me some respite, whatever the book is. Mm. So there's something about getting really stuck in what I would describe as the mean, M-E-M-E, -M -E, yeah? And what I mean by that, because the, the term M-E, the meme has been so completely commercialized by social media, but mm. in, es in essence, a meme is suggesting, and if I give an example of this, it's like being a stuck, it's like, it's like a stuck record. I don't know if you, you know that experience when you're listening to a song and then there's this point to realize that the record's stuck. Now, you know, I know today records are not the flavor of the month, although they're coming back into popularity. But I don't know if you remember those days when you were listening to a record and then realize about five or ten minutes later, oh my God, it was stuck. Remember that experience? And all you had to do was you had to just lift the needle. I, I think that's because you were smoking too much dope, Mike. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not going to disagree with that. I, I, I hold my hands up to that. But, but do you understand the point I'm making? No, I do, it's I do. Yeah. The same as, it's the same as ruminating or overthinking. I mean, it's, it's a very effective way to drive ourselves crazy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so you're, sort of, you're sort of talking about, it, it's, it's a constant cultivate, cultivation of consciousness, isn't it? Really. You're sort of bringing a kind of awareness and a consciousness. Correct. To the situation. Yeah. Not only that, but it's also about, I agree with that, but it's also about, you know, training my brain to be as present as I possibly can. So it's about mindfulness, it's about yeah. consciousness, and it's about awareness. And I think those are really three powerful uh, resources that, that we can use to transform our lives. So, so the next bit is, you're talking about being as fast and as agile as the curveball. Yeah, well, I, I talk about that, a lot of things. That, does that follow on from what you're saying? Because um, for me, it's sort of getting ahead of the curve. It's a, it's a variation, I guess. But or is it? Would you see? Would you say it's the same thing? Or just give me a moment. Let me let me just think that through within the context that you're um, you're suggesting. Yeah. Um, I I see it as. I see it as a contributing factor it is what I is what I'm suggesting. So, you know, if we work just with the metaphor, um, most of us are doing what we can to avoid the curveball, duck the curveball. But there is something, and I, look, I don't want to get into the esoterics of the metaphysics of this, but yeah. I do think yeah. there's something about by inhabiting that space by inhabiting that space, we become the curveball. So we use that as an opportunity for growth. So we use that as an opportunity to becoming emotionally agile. And um, I don't know if you know the work of, I think I've mentioned her to you before, um, Sandra David, who wrote a book called Emotional Agility. And I, that, that's, that's, where, that, that's where that concept comes from. Because the more in tune and more in touch we are with our feelings, and you know this yourself, uh, Chris, is that we do become emotionally agile. We can, whatever life throws us, 
if we process what we're feeling, so in other words, when the fear comes up, can we sit in the discomfort of the fear? Yeah. When the sadness comes up, can we sit in the discomfort of the sadness? Not distract ourselves. When the anger comes up, instead of acting the anger out, sit in the discomfort of the anger, including hurt and shame. So a yeah. lot of Sandra's work, who, by the way, is also South African, um, and, you know, I, I admire her and I'm jealous of her because I would have liked to have written that book. Um, I probably still can, yeah? Uh, but, but, but I think there's something about the more comfortable we are in our body and the more comfortable we are in our feelings. We are not only emotional, emotionally agile, but we're also emotionally resilient. So whatever curveball life throws at us, we can embrace it, not avoid it, not duck out the way. What, what are some of the yes buts that you get in the face of this sort of uh, way of inviting people to sort of approach their own lives? Listen, buddy, I love, I love the question, but, but let's, let, let me be very clear about this. I don't get yes buts, okay? People, by the time they come to my program, they are on their knees. They've tried every avoidance tactic they possibly could. And by the time they come to a program, they're on their knees. So in that moment, guess who I am? I'm God. Yeah, that's who I am in that moment. But of course, as they start to reconnect to who they are, guess what they realize? That they're also God. Because they can make choices. And they can recognize they have choices. By the time they come, they have no, they, they, they're not aware of a choice. By the time they leave the program, they have a smorgasbord of choices that they didn't have before they came. So they are there hungry, hungry. No, I mean, I, I kind of understand what you're sort of, yeah. sort of seeing with you, but, but even in that, I mean, people are still hold on to the familiar. Um, as they get stronger, their, their resistance to change becomes, as they begin to feel more sort of alive and energized again, there's a sort of human, it's human nature to sort of, repeat patterns to go back into old old ways of seeing things in those moments you must what would you do well look but you know by the time they they you know they cut the umbilical cord from the mothership meaning the program they are out there on their own however they do have support so you know we have built-in support networks their their anger buddies which is one of the rules you know to use the support network so every time they're going to meltdown they just, all they've got to do is WhatsApp their group and people become very actively supportive in order to help them out of the, you know, the ditch or the hole they've climbed into. That's one of the things we do, but we also deliver on a, a, a therapy group that comes, two groups that come up once a month, which is called Stay on Track, which is about, it's designed to keep people on, on track. But the other thing, Chris, that we're doing is, um, I've just developed, I'm just developing and it's, it'll be launched in probably the next, next month is a, a new website called the wisdom track i'm doing a bit of advertising for myself uh, but the wisdom track is really designed to keep you on track so the therapy group stay on track keeps you on track anyway but the wisdom track adds a whole plethora of um resources interviews like this videos that are worthwhile watching books that are worthwhile reading podcasts that are worthwhile listening to presentations that are worthwhile listening to. So it's about a bank of resources, but you know, keeping in mind it's in the context of what I do, anger management and, and stress management and emotional resilience. Um, so it's about using whatever resource, including support networks, in order to kind of stay in the work. I mean, I mean that sounds great, what, what you're uh, developing. I suppose it reminds me of the that there is an there isn't an end point to this. This is a sort of ongoing sort of we're human, so this is an ongoing challenge. There will be moments where we stumble or go down the rabbit hole, but you're sort of bringing a a, a way of of within people's day to day life as a sort of reminder and encouragement and support to to keep conscious, to keep aware. Look, Chris, my, my client group doesn't have a choice, mate. They just don't have a choice. You know, I remember the movie Anger Management with Adam Sandler and, and, and Jack Nichols. Nichol yeah. Nichols. Nicholson? 
local cinema. Okay, cool. And, um, you know, I remember there's a sequence where Jack follows, um, you know, his client into the boss's office and he starts to lie. Adam Sandler starts to lie to the boss. And Jack Nicholson steps in and says, listen, you've got to understand that with anger, man I'm paraphrasing, you know, with anger management, it's like having a disease. And when you have a disease, you take care of the disease. We just, we just lost. True. I don't think we're... Mike, we're, we're losing you a little bit. Um, you back again? I think you're back. Yeah, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Just the, the, those last few sentences. Okay. Um, I will be, well, so, you know, you've got to take the drugs, you've got to take the injections, you, you've got to stay on the medication because you have a particular condition. And that is true of anger. It's a condition. It's not a, um, a, a physical condition, but it's a combination of physical and mental condition. And so if you think about somebody like myself, you know, I recognize I'm a hothead and I am very quick to react to situations. Um, even though I have impulse control, I always know that when I'm exhausted uh, and I'm stressed, I, I will find myself reacting. So I have to work my own program day in, day out. That's the reality I'm faced with. Uh, just some of the sort of, because we're going to have to move into questions, period. But there's a couple of things we haven't, just sort of building on what you've just been saying. Um, so, so no buts, no ifs. There's a few other sort of sort of techniques, suggestions for how you keep focused on the on the sense of hope and positives. Look, Chris, you know what I delight in in my work is seeing how people create obstacles for themselves. Yeah. The, a lot of my work is about helping people to recognize that they create obstacles by the way that they think about things. So, so for example, you know, point 13 is don't ask why it does not work. Instead, say when it works. You know, it's simple reframing of the way that we use language. In the same way is yeah, uh, yeah. never say never, never say can't. There is no such thing as never and can't. It's yeah. simply about the resistance that you have. And so I'm constantly educating people in hearing how they limit themselves through the language that they use and how they reinforce those limiting beliefs. So I've just been told to get off WhatsApp. I'm supposed to play. And it's one of the problems of having to read the questions as well as keeping attentive to, to you, Mike. But I'm... I'm assuming all, everybody is listening to you while I get to the questions. Sure. I mean, I would have assumed that some of the questions would already be up on the Zoom chat, so we could both see those questions. Let, can you get them? I've got a couple of questions. Well, I saw one. I saw one, and then that was it. Didn't, and I didn't see any others. Okay, let me, give you, let me give you a question. Does trusting your future self offer a get out for learning or growth now? What is the pathway to this future self? Wow, what a cool question. Whoever that is, what a cool question. Uh, Chris, can you just repeat the question? I love the question. Does trusting your future self offer a get out for learning or growth now? What is the pathway to this future self? So look, I think there is something to be said about when I talk about the future self, what am I talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it in, in a metaphorical context. Yeah. So that's the first thing I want to say. And, and no, it's not a get, get out clause at all, because if I am faced with adversity, I'm looking for any opportunity to jump the curve. I'm looking for any opportunity to reframe my experience and see it in more positive light. So I think there's something to be said about, um, let, me see if I can, let me see if I can explain this, um, is using that as a simple tool, which then triggers mm. my imagination. Yeah. And you know, when I think about somebody like James Hillman, I think you know James Hillman work, the archetypal yeah. 
psychologist, yeah. you know, absolute ridiculous genius. And I remember very clearly, I attended one of his workshops and he said, imagination is everything. So then, you know, if we don't buy into the fact that there is a future self, yeah, that's not the issue here, but imagine a future self. And you use the imagination of the future self who then has a dialogue with you and you have a dialogue with him or her. So there is something about imagination that we can utilize as a resource for transforming our own lives. And we can use imagination to limit us and inhibit us and keep us stuck. So whoever asked the question, thank you so much for asking the question, because that's how I would define the future self. And, and, and have uh, you asked is that answering the, um, the pathway to this future self? Imagination is the pathway. Is the future yeah, imagination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I don't know if you have a view on that, Chris, because I, I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, well, well, I was thinking, it, for me, I suppose I see it as much as being in the moment, being in the present, um, that it gives us a sort of, it grounds us, it makes us sort of, in using our imagination, it brings us in more in touch with, I suppose, what you were saying earlier on about possibilities and hope. Um, I've got another one from yeah. uh, uh, a student doctor. As a doctor, how can we, how can we have greater control over our future in one organisation that is so structured? Ah, okay. I love that question because I do have another point about control. So the thing that I'm very aware of, we can prepare for our future. Whoever asked that question, thank you. Cool, very cool, on target. You can prepare for your future. You know, I look at it within the context of when I'm delivering on, on uh, stress management. Um, you can prepare for your future. You can do the best, best, preparation you possibly can. It does not mean you can control it. It does not mean we can control it at all. Mm. So if I give an example of that, I'm neurotic yeah. about getting to the airport on time. I'm neurotic about it, okay? I won't relax until I'm past passport control and I'm sitting in the waiting area ready to board my plane. So I will go an hour, hour and a half, two hours, three hours earlier, depending on which airplane, which airport I'm flying from. And so, I'm very aware that I did a flight, uh, I was doing a flight from Heathrow. Now I am two hours away from Heathrow. No, an hour and a half away from three, uh, Heathrow. So I gave myself three hours to get there. Three hours to get there, okay? And I was really happy because halfway to Heathrow, the traffic was smooth. And then we hit a wall of traffic. It was an accident. I prepared for the future. I couldn't control it. So whoever asks the question, I don't know if that's useful, but that has to be kept in your awareness. You can be the best educated doctor in the universe. Doesn't mean you're going to be working in the best hospital in the universe. No. Did you get the flight? No, of course not. Oh, you didn't get the flight? No, no, I didn't. No, I got stuck in traffic. But, but at least I prepared because, because the problem was is that if I hadn't left on, uh, given myself enough time, I would have been beating myself up for not giving myself enough time. But I did give myself enough time. And I do that, yeah. So someone, someone's asked um, if you could recap on the six rules that you mentioned oh. for framing your thinking process when faced with fight, flight, fight, fright, reaction. Cool. So the first one is to stop, think, take a look at the big picture. The second one, it's okay to have a different opinion. The third one is to simply listen. The fourth one is to use your support network. It's irrelevant whether it's anger management or anything else. Use support. Talk to people. Reach out. The next one is use an anger journal. Now, you know, keeping in mind I'm an expert in anger management, but you can use an, a journal for anything. What you want to do, you want to stop letting the anger or those feelings, whatever they are, rent space in your head. The problem is we overthink and we ruminate and we drive ourselves completely crazy. The sixth one is don't take anything personally. 
And the seventh one is let go of your expectations of how I should be, how you should be, and how the world should be. The issues around the should. So just, just back to the sixth one. So to say a bit more, don't take it personally. Don't take anything personally. So when you say that, what do you mean? What, what does that actually... Look, I don't even know how much time because that's fairly sophisticated. But if I, if I kind of run through it, um, how, how are we doing for time? I'm not even sure. Uh, we've got okay. we're doing about 20, okay. 20 minutes or so. Cool. Okay. So, look, one of the issues with my client group, um, Chris, is that, and I think we've discussed this before, most of them suffer from shame. Um, we call that self-defense anger. They're very, very sensitive to being criticized or being told off or being humiliated in some way. And they, you know, come out of their box fighting and all they want to do is, um, you know, grabs and grab somebody's throat and throttle them. So what I've identified, certainly in my body of work, is that self-defense anger is directly linked to shame, toxic shame. Now, if you suffer from shame and it's, irrelevant where you are on the spectrum, you'll find yourself reacting to some things and not reacting to other things. But the point I wanna make is that people who suffer from toxic shame take everything personally, even, even if it's not personal, they'll take it personally. And you know, I have a history of toxic shame and I have a history of taking things personally. So I would take personally when somebody rolled their eyes or touched it under their breath or dismissed me with a flick of their hand. And so what I had to do is I had to train myself to stop taking things personally. How did I do that? There's a fantastic book on the subject called Don't Take Anything Personally. And what this particular author suggests is that every time we take something personally, what it does, it triggers negative core beliefs. Now, negative core beliefs, and when I talk about core beliefs, equates to me being a failure, useless, hopeless, um, unlovable, a bad person, I shouldn't have been born. Yeah, that's what would be defined as negative core beliefs. And by the way, you know, the participants can key in, don't take anything personally, uh, uh, or key negative core beliefs on Google, and you'll find a lot of information on that. So what I have to do, as soon as I've taken something personally, Chris, if I can catch myself, no, sorry, let me, let me start again. Every time my anger gets triggered, I need to catch myself and I need to ask myself, have I taken it personally? And if I have taken it personally, I ask myself, what did I make that mean to me? Or what do I make that mean to me? And as you drill down into making sense of what you make it mean, i.e. the way you interpret it, it's about pulling out your negative core belief. Now, I've done this process many, many times. My negative core belief is, however hard I try, I can never get anything right. That equates to me being a failure. Now, there's no evidence of that. It's a story I've made up. And so the idea is every time you take something personally, it, it triggers a negative core belief. We all have hours and hours of negative core beliefs, according to John Bradshaw. And um, we need to identify what these negative core beliefs are. And we need to reframe our experience to those negative core beliefs. So what is the opposite of being a failure? Well, actually, I'm a huge success. And, and guess what? I am. So every time I go to that dark place, I have to remind myself that I have no evidence of that. Have I failed at things? Of course, I've failed at things. It does not equate to me being a failure. Mm -hmm. How's that for a cool answer? No, that's a that's a great answer. Um, uh, I thought you were going to talk for a bit longer. Oh, uh, um, <laughs> you throw me a little bit. Let me just try and pick up. Get up. Is anger ever a useful mechanism or coping uh, coping strategy? Well, look, uh, I mean, great, great question. I mean, anger is a coping strategy. It's not a, it's not a very effective coping strategy, but it is. But look, what, 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 I, what I'm very aware of is actually anger is really healthy. Um, because if you look at anger in, a, in, a, in a, a very sobering way, without all the associations, um, anger is simply a feeling like the rest of our feelings. 
And so really, you know, when I say to you, Chris, I'm happy, you know, say, oh, well, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but if I say to you, Chris, I'm angry, you'd automatically think, oh, oh, I, want, I wonder if he's angry with me. Yeah? Or I wonder what he's angry about. But the truth is, is that if I feel angry, yeah. I don't act it out. And I think that's the important thing. So, you know, we've had this conversation the last time we met where I said, be as angry as you want to be, but you can also be kind. So there's a big difference between being an imploder or an exploder or a big difference between being passive aggressive and what we call active aggressive. Mm -hmm. But being angry is simply being able to say, Chris, I'm angry with you and I need you to listen to me and I need you to take me seriously. And I know there are times I don't listen to you and take you seriously. But of course, our association with anger is screaming and shouting and hurling abuse and acting it out. And none of that's true. Anger yeah. is simply feeling and it's been given a terrible, terrible press. One thing I wanted to cover a little bit with you, because, I mean, these seminars, webinars have been set up. Um, I mean, all kinds of people are uh, listening in, uh, but the, the core group is, is doctors. And I know you work with doctors. You work, I mean, you've mentioned quite a number of your clients are doctors. Is there yeah. a, is there a, are there certain things that you would sort of, from working with doctors, you'd have insight about in terms of, environments doctors work in or situations or uh, uh, maybe even possibly the kind of people who become doctors I mean do you have your own sort of thoughts insights well look you know Chris it's a great question thank you um, doctors are hardwired for adversity I, I have a view that Doctors are, have always been hardwired, even before they became doctors. I think I've already mentioned to you, uh, I have these psychologists, uh, I have a family in, in Israel who's married into a family of these very well-known Israeli psychologists. And the psychologist said, tell me your career, your profession, and I'll tell you your wound. Mm -hmm. Do you remember me saying that to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so... You know, the thing about doctors, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be a smart ass here, but um, it might be, and I don't know whether the doctors who are listening to this um, conversation this evening, um, the conversations I've had with doctors is that they didn't feel cared for. So they learned to care uh, in hope that one day somebody would care for them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's some of the uh, conversations I've had. And... Some of them have acknowledged that and said, yeah, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an important point. So if you think about why they get angry, it's because they don't feel cared for. They don't feel the support and the care and the love and the commitment and the dedication that they give. It's not reciprocated, whether it's in their organizational settings or possibly at home. So I think that's worthwhile pondering. And, and the sort of... The sort of the ways you approach that in, in the work you do? Well, essentially, you know, it's encouraging them um, to reach out more, to articulate and express their needs, uh, to not socially stoic. I mean by that, that because of the profession, they have become desensitized and they have to become sensitized and you know part of you okay doc is about training or educating doctors to inhabit their feelings um, it's not that they're uncare uncaring and un un unempathetic and comp compassionate of course they are but the, the argument often is, you're so caring, compassionate, and kind to your patients, but why do you not treat me in the same way as you treat your patients? You know, we come from a wife or a husband, or possibly even children. But I think it's because of the desensitization that their ability to connect to their feelings is not possible simply because of the environments that they're working in which is adversarial anyway, 
They're dealing with one crisis, one emergency after another. Mm. And they're living with it all day, every day. They've acclimatized to it at a very young age. Otherwise, they couldn't survive. It's like teachers. They couldn't survive teaching. But, but, but are you then saying, I'm not quite clear what you're saying, as a result of that, then what is it they have to do to sort of attend to their own needs? They need to identify what their needs are. They need to express them and they need to meet their own needs. Because their loved ones or the environment they work in would meet their needs, but sometimes they're not able to. And I, if I give you an example, I'm angry with you because you don't respect me. Yeah, okay. So what does it do? It raises a question that maybe you don't respect me because you simply don't respect me. Or, or you don't respect yourself, so how could you respect me? So what I have to do is I have to train myself to respect myself. So whether you respect me or not, doesn't mean my life's a disaster. Do you get the distinction? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there is something about they need to communicate their feelings, they need to communicate their needs, they need to be a priority in their own lives, and, and they need to become emotionally resilient, not intellectually resilient, emotionally resilient. You know, I was having a conversation um, with a, a client of mine yesterday, an 18-year-old who is going off to, to university in September. And um, he, he said he doesn't think he could ever become a doctor. I said, yeah, I agree with you. But I, I think I could be a doctor. And the problem is that I don't have a photographic memory and I have no passion for medicine. But if I had a photographic memory and I had a passion for, me uh, for medicine, I could probably be a doctor. But I know that if I had to, as a human being, work in a field hospital, it wouldn't take long for me to pick up tips. And I have the internet. Someone's just um, asked again about how do you trust yourself if your history is sort of sort of uh, peppered with things where you thought it would things would go right and they didn't how, how do you okay so look that is you know i mean I, it's a great question how do you how do you train yourself to trust yourself the way you do that is you look at the obstacles that you created in order not to trust yourself now it's a great question but the only way to illustrate that Mm -hmm. is to do it experientially, you know, to have uh, somebody who engages in the process and I do the process with them. I don't know whether we have time to do the process or not, but why don't I trust myself? I don't trust myself because of my history, yeah? But I've also created obstacles because of my history that I don't trust myself. So what I've got to do is I've got to remove those obstacles. And, and, and train myself to trust myself. So, for example, Chris, uh, I mean, I, let me improvise here. I, I won't do it with you because you'll probably uh, freak out. But there's five questions that I have to ask myself. In order to trust myself, what I need to accept, what I need to let go of, what I need to give up, what I need to acknowledge, what do I need to admit? Five questions. So, it's a way of bypassing your defense mechanism and using another part of the brain in order to recognize how you've created those obstacles. Because there's only one person who can create, create those obstacles and that's me. So if I've created it, I can uncreate it. So let me improvise. So um, in order for me to trust myself, I need to accept that I'm human and I'm flawed and I have limitations, and sometimes I mess up. Yeah. Yeah? I need to admit that it's okay to not trust myself. I need to acknowledge that by trusting myself, I could potentially transform my life. I need to let go of this idea that I am untrustworthy. Does that make sense? Yep. And then there's the final one, which I don't know what it was, because so there was acknowledge, accept, admit, 
uh, let go, let's go with let go. Um, in order to trust myself, what do I need to let go of? I need to let go of these limiting beliefs. Yeah. And then once I identify what, which is the biggest, which has the biggest impact on me after asking myself those five questions or having them asked of me and say, for example, um, the big one is I need to let go of my limiting beliefs. Then the second part of that conversation is that if I let go of those limiting beliefs, how would my life be different? Well, I feel more relaxed. And if you were more relaxed, how would your life be different? Um, I would probably be more comfortable around others. And if you're more comfortable around others, how would your life be different? Well, I'll actually be more open and more transparent and more vulnerable. You getting this? Yeah. And so as I start to reconstruct myself after deconstructing myself, I can actually get to the point where actually I could end up being happy. And that's what I mean by we create these obstacles which perpetuate needless suffering. But I have created the suffering because of my private logic and my mistaken Nathan and negative core beliefs. I mean, I'm sort of hearing you, and, and, and in some ways it's a continuation of what Caroline Webb was saying last oh, week. Interesting. Which, which is, I mean, she used the word, put yourself in a place to discover. I, I sort of see it alongside be curious, because you're sort of saying be open to not knowing, to finding out, to, to seeing what emerges without using your own, your own sort of historical references. Yes. Although maybe that you could also, if there's a historical reference, that you kind of do the opposite in a way. If that's the moment you realise that there's something you could possibly be curious or put yourself into a position to discover. Yes. So and I need to pause. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Well, that's kind of the moment to remind yourself yes. to do that. Yes. But, you know, when I say I can't or I won't or it won't happen, it'll never happen... I'm already creating obstacles for myself. You know, I'm working on a project at the moment with, a, with a, uh, an IT bloke who thinks binary. Yeah, he thinks logically. And he's already creating obstacles. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about not, not therapeutically, it's a project I'm working on, building an app um, for the police in the, in, the U, in the US around race. And... Um, we start the conversation and he's already creating obstacles and it's just like, dude, don't do that. Don't, don't create obstacles even before we started. Well, we can't do that. What do you mean we can't do that? How do you know we can't do that? I just know. Well, you know, give me the, provide me the evidence that you know this. Yeah. So please, let's stop with the creating obstacles. And I think that's what we do as a human race, but we've got to recognize that we do that. It's so limiting of our own growth and potential. The last uh, point, the point 14 in, in, in the 14 points, is believe in miracles. Yeah, of course. So tell us. Well, you know, Chris, I must tell you, I feel a bit embarrassed by this because I was at a, I was at a conference in Chicago and th there was these two guest speakers, this, uh, this man and this woman. And this was, this was probably about 10, no, it was about, no, 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 it was like 16 years ago. They started their presentations looking at the audience and saying, you are a miracle. You are a miracle. And they didn't stop for like 15 minutes of telling us that we're miracles. You know? And it's like, oh my God, this is like so cringy. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, why I, I, included in, uh, I, I included miracles, believe in miracles, because what, what, what do I want to believe in? I want to believe in possibilities. I want to believe in that there is a space for me in the universe. There is a space for me on this planet to do extraordinary things. However humble I am or however magnificent I am. So believing in miracles is really another way of saying believe in possibilities. Mm -hmm. Having hope. Yeah. That, that's a great way to end tonight's uh, webinar mike um thank you so much for um taking time out to come and share with us your rich thoughts and reflections both both your personal life and also your clinical work that you do with so many different people um i think what you're what you've contributing to is a sort of well 
first of all, a discussion, a debate, a conversation about, about emotional and mental well-being, but also kind of as I hear it is do get curious, do kind of uh, put yourself in a position to sort of um, think outside of the box of who you think you are, your identity, your, your history, um, um, and begin to discover things about new possibilities, but also reference the fears that you have, the sort of your histories as, as, as a point of beginning to move away from them. Um, so thank you for that. I'm not sure you might have frozen, Mike. Yeah, um, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, um, uh, and I think the other, the other thing is just normalizing all of this. I think part of the UOK doc purpose, the goal is just to normalize these sort of conversations to make it clear that we all struggle in our own different ways. Um, and particularly for doctors who are constantly having to deal with adversity, challenges, life or death decisions. Um, so thank you for contributing to the, the conversation that's so valuable. Uh, in terms of people listening in, next week we've got Tom Mitchell, uh, um, captain of England rugby team. Um, I've already spoken to him earlier in the week and he's got some great reflections, thoughts, uh, his own personal journey in terms of leadership, mentoring, just the challenges of, of operating in situations of high stress, demand, etc. Uh, so do please join us for that conversation. Uh, and Mike, I hope you can come back again, maybe in the September program to continue this conversation. Uh, so thank you, Mike. And thank you for everybody listening in. Did you have a final? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, if, if anybody's interested in the work that we do, um, the website is www.angermanage.co.uk or you can just key in Mike Fisher beating anger and you'll find out more about our work. Brilliant. Apologies that I didn't do that on your behalf, but I'm glad I'm you did gonna, it. I'm not going to take it personally. Um, thank you very much, Mike. And thank you everybody for listening. Thank you.